let's take a few minutes to review some of the challenges of accounting. And of course, one of the biggest ones is going to be fraud. In its broadest sense, fraud can be defined as the use of deception or trickery for personal gain. Unfortunately, in the United States, fraud is one of the fastest growing crimes. It accounts for more losses than robbery. And in the business world, fraud is either committed by a business organization or against a business organization. An organization's top management is usually responsible for fraud that is committed by a business organization. This management fraud typically involves fraudulent financial reporting. Fraudulent financial reporting most often makes a company's earnings look better than they are. The goal of overstating earnings is to help increase a company's stock price or to ensure larger year-end bonuses for upper management. Fraudulent financial reporting is achieved when management does the following. They overstate revenues by overstating receivables related to revenue that has not yet been earned, or understating unearned revenue, meaning recording revenue when cash is received even though goods or services have not yet been provided, and or they understate expenses by overstating the value of assets such as inventory equipment and buildings, or recording assets that don't exist, or understating amounts owed to suppliers, employees, or creditors. Here's another biggie that we uh, encounter often, which is employee embezzlement. This is the primary form of fraud committed against a business or organization. Employee embezzlement usually involves a misappropriation of business assets by an employee. Employees can steal cash, inventory, tools, supplies, or other assets from the employer. Establish fake companies and have the employer pay those phony companies for goods or services that are never delivered and then intercept the fraudulent and fraudulently cash the checks. I've also seen people pay, for example, boyfriends or girlfriends as employees who've never actually worked at the business. They may engage in various types of disbursement schemes. In Employee embezzlement involving disbursement schemes takes place when an employee tricks a company into giving up cash for an invalid person. Examples of disbursement schemes include the following check tampering. The employee writes a fraudulent check and makes the check payable to him or herself. Or the employee obtains a check intended for an outside party, endorses, endorses the check, and then cashes it. Cash register scheme, so the employee gives a false refund for returning merchandise by filling out a refund form and putting it in the cash register, and then the employee pockets the cash. Another related scheme happens when the employee accepts cash from a customer for a purchase but does not record the transaction in the cash register. And expense schemes here are when an employee overbills a company for travel or other business related expenses such as lunches, hotels, air travel, parking fees, and cab fare. My guess is most of you who've been in the workplace have seen some sort of um, unethical behavior by previous or co-workers in some forms of employee embezzlement. I've had students tell me before that they've um, worked a cash register and they will scan an item and then skip an item and scan an item and skip an item. Those are all types of employee embezzlement. Bribes and kickbacks here are another form of employee embezzlement. So, for example, they may um, take bribes or kickbacks from suppliers in exchange. The employee turns a blind eye to the supplier, charging the employer higher prices. Or, for example, they turn a blind eye to the delivery of inferior goods or authorize payments to the supplier for goods that were never delivered. Customers, uh, employees may work with customers in exchange for granting the customer a lower sales price or for giving the customer goods or services for which the employer is never paid. That was the last example that I just gave. Let's look at the fraud triangle here and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, for fraud to occur, three factors must also exist. The first one here is going to be perceived pressure, then rationalization and perceived opportunity. So let's break down each one of those in more detail. So perceived pressure causes an individual to feel pressure to commit fraud. So the most likely source of perceived pressure is going to be financial pressure or work-related pressure. Financial pressure can be caused by things like unexpected financial needs, such as medical bills, 
a drug or act alcohol habit, living beyond one's means, a gambling addiction, unanticipated financial losses, or excessive bills and personal debt. Work-related pressure also has several possible causes. So an employee might feel dissatisfied with his or her job because of a sense of being underpaid or underappreciated, or an, an employee might have been overlooked for a promotion. Either of those things can motivate an employee to get even with the company by committing fraud. Also, if a company is performing poorly, it's possible for people within management to feel they are personally responsible. And the perceived pressure caused by this feeling of personal responsibility can lead them to commit management fraud by falsifying the financial statements. The next element in the fraud triangle that must be present in order for fraud to occur is rationalization. So rationalization is simply finding a good reason for doing things that we know we are, that we know are wrong. So it's human nature and very few people, if any, do not rationalize their behavior at some point or time. So employees who commit fraud attempt to justify their actions and convince themselves that the fraud is not wrong by rationalizing their behavior. So some common rationalizations used by individuals involved in fraud include, I didn't steal the money, I'm just borrowing it, I'll pay it back. I deserve a raise and the company owes it to me. It's not gonna hurt anybody or once the company gets over its financial difficulties, I'll correct the book. So it's for a good purpose. The final portion of the uh, fraud triangle here is perceived opportunity. And that's when an individual who commits fraud must perceive that an opportunity exists to commit the fraud, conceal it, and avoid punishment. So an opportunity to commit fraud is often perceived when there is easy access to assets or when assets are poorly accounted for by an organization. Out of the three elements of the fraud triangle, a business can have the most influence over the element of perceived opportunity. This is where we really, um, if we can remove this part of that fraud triangle, we can prevent some fraud. So uh, basically the most effective way for a business to prevent fraud is to reduce, eliminate the perceived opportunity for an employee to misappropriate company assets or for a manager to falsify financial information. And we'll talk about internal controls here in just a minute. Now, as far as legal and ethical responsibilities go, accountants have both a legal and an ethical responsibility. Society expects accountants to act ethically, and ethical behavior is conduct which requires adherence to the highest standards than required by law. So the law is going to state how we are required to act. Ethics state how we expect people to act. Now, it's extremely important in accounting because, again, if people are relying on these financial statements and they're not accurate because of fraud, then they're really not worth anything. So we need to ensure that um, there's some accountability and ethical behavior going on in accounting. And unfortunately, back in the early 2000s, late um, 1990s, there was a lot of fraud going on in some very large companies that impacted a lot of people. Myself was one of them. Uh, you may have heard of Enron, WorldCom, Tyco. All of those um, companies were financial reporting information that was inaccurate. And um, in response to that, the United States enacted a special law in 2002 called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. It's also referred to as SOX or Sarbox. And it only applies to publicly traded companies, and it established a public a company accounting oversight board, the PCAOB, which is a private non nonprofit corporation that oversees the auditors of public companies. So those are people who come into companies and actually just kind of double check and make sure everything looks like it's being done correctly. And the PCAOB protects the interests of investors by helping ensure fair and independent audit reports. Now, the PCAOB reports directly to the SEC, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission. It also requires that external auditors report to an audit committee rather than to an organization's management. And prior to that, the external auditors just reported directly to a company's upper management. So if upper management was in, in on the fraud, they probably wouldn't report that. 
It also requires that a company's chief executive officer, so the CEO and the CFO, certify all annual and quarterly reports filed by an organization. A couple of the other big components here to Sarbanes-Oxley are that the internal controls of a company are now also evaluated. There are some restrictions on how many services an audit company can provide for a business. So for example, they can't do their auditing, their taxes, do consulting for them because then you're getting so entwined that if you find something, you probably don't want to go ahead and blow the whistle. There are some term limits on people who actually lead the audit. And as I mentioned, there are some severe penalties now for people who uh, violate those rules. So we mentioned that the CEOs and CFOs have to sign off and certify that the financial statements are accurate or that they're, more importantly, there's no materially untrue statement, so large dollar amounts, so that it does fairly present the financial condition and the results of operations in all material respects of the organization. The officers are also responsible for signing off that the internal controls have been evaluated within the previous 90 days. And then they would disclose all deficiencies in their internal controls on any fraud that involves employees who are involved with internal activities and or any significant changes in internal controls that could have a negative impact on those internal controls.